Ja, herzlich willkommen von meiner Seite erst einmal zur vierten Veranstaltung des digitalen Pflege- und Gesundheitsratschlags der Linkfraktion und der Rosa-Luxemburg-Stiftung. Heute wollen wir unseren Blick richten nach Kalifornien. Dort sind im Oktober 2020, also mitten in der Pandemie, die Beschäftigten des Highland Hospital in Oakland in einen fünftägigen Streik getreten. Ihre Forderungen, mehr Personal, das Ende der chronischen Unterfinanzierung und der gewerkschaftsfeindlichen Aktivitäten in der Klinik sowie ihre Rekommunalisierung, also der Klinik. Wie erfolgreich der Streik war, ob die Forderungen erfüllt wurden und wie es aktuell um die Arbeitsbedingungen von Gesundheitsarbeiterinnen in den USA bestellt ist, erfahren wir von John Pearson. John ist Krankenpfleger in der Notaufnahme des Highland Hospital in Oakland, Gewerkschaftsaktivist und auch Vorsitzender der, der lokalen Sektion seiner Gewerkschaft. John, herzlich willkommen. Schön, dass du da bist. Wie das mit der Übersetzung geht, will ich noch gerade sagen, die Übersetzung läuft über einen eigenen Account. Das ist dieser Account Interpreter German English German. Äh, wenn ihr auf die Kachel des Accounts geht, könnt ihr ihn anschalten, dann hört ihr die Übersetzung. Es wird in beide Sprachen übersetzt, also Englisch-Deutsch und Deutsch-Englisch. Wenn ihr nur die englische Übersetzung hören wollt, müsst ihr den Account abschalten, wenn Deutsch gesprochen wird. Also de facto, wenn ich rede. Ja, bevor es losgeht, noch ein paar kurze Hinweise zum Ablauf der Veranstaltung. Im ersten Teil möchte ich mich mit John unterhalten, ein Gespräch führen. Im zweiten Teil geht es dann um eure Fragen oder Diskussionsbeiträge zum Thema. Ihr könnt die Beiträge direkt in den Chat schreiben. Ich versuche dann, sie in das Gespräch aufzunehmen. Wenn ihr im zweiten Teil einen Wortbeitrag machen möchtet, dann schreibt bitte in den Chat Wortmeldung oder abgekürzt WM und euren Namen. Der erste Teil äh, wird auch aufgezeichnet, der zweite Teil wird dann nicht aufgezeichnet, auch wenn ihr dann ihre, eure Wortbeiträge macht. Ja, dann steigen wir ein, John. Wir haben im ersten Teil ein paar Fragen vorbereitet. Zum Einstieg erstmal eine Frage zu der aktuellen Corona-Situation. Kalifornische Krankenhäuser in der Corona-Pandemie. Wie lief das letzte Jahr? Welche Probleme und Krisen gab es oder hattet ihr? Good evening, everyone, um, and thank you for that uh, introduction, Harold. Um, uh, and everyone, uh, please, uh, I, I appreciate your patience in advance um, uh, as I uh, speak to you in English uh, and you listen to the translation. Um, uh, that's, uh, that's a good question. Um, uh, the way I would describe it uh, here in the United States and, and definitely uh, where I work in Alameda County, which is uh, in Northern California, um, as Harald was explaining, um, I am a nurse uh, in our county level uh, public health care system. Um, uh, the county um, is fairly large, contains a number of cities um, and suburbs. Um, and uh, the health system, the public health system we work in, uh, is pretty typical um, of health care in most of the country. Um, and the way I would describe um, the way that the pandemic uh, affected us uh, from the beginning is that um, not that it caused uh, new problems, but that it revealed um, underlying problems that have been happening for a long, long, long time that uh, we healthcare workers are very familiar with. Um, and, um, you know, among many problems, uh, just to give you some examples of, of the most obvious ones that the pandemic um, exacerbated, made much worse. Uh, is chronic understaffing. Um, uh, one way to think about that is that in the United States, um, because we don't have a nationalized uh, public health care system, we don't even have guaranteed um, health care uh, or health insurance. Um, uh, basically, you know, if you if you just kind of step back and look at it, um, what that means is that our health care system in the entire country is just not set up to take care of everyone in the country. Um, it's only set up to take care of the people that are able to pay through private means or for people who meet the criteria for the government insurance, which means that you're over a particular age around retirement um, or um, your income is extremely, extremely low uh, poverty level income. Um, and in some states, uh, the cutoff for that even um, is different. Um, And so what that means is that all of a sudden we have this public health crisis that affects 
the majority of the country, almost every person, um, well, certainly every person really um, needs to be tested and eventually vaccinated. Uh, a, a, you know, a huge uh, wave of people who weren't going to the hospital or seeing the doctor all of a sudden uh, have symptoms that they need to get checked out. Um, and when the pandemic hit, uh, that discrepancy, that difference between the number of people that actually need health care, which is everyone, um, and the number of people that we're actually um, uh, set up to take care of, um, I think was revealed. Um, another, uh, you know, probably the, the most apparent in the press uh, problem is the lack of infrastructure to provide um, healthcare equipment and supplies. Uh, it, in our part of uh, the healthcare workplace, we had very big fights with our employer and with the, the county government about um, personal protective equipment and other supplies that reduce the spread of disease um, and keep healthcare workers and patients uh, uh, safe. Um, and the, that was already a problem. Equipment shortages are um, f uh, very familiar for all of us healthcare workers, especially in the public sector where I work. Um, uh, but the pandemic uh, revealed it in a very dramatic way um, that caught the attention of the public as well. And so that's, I think, in sum, how I would describe the way the pandemic um, has affected us is it revealed underlying problems that have been there all along and brought them to public attention. Ja, vielen Dank. Ähm, du arbeitest, soweit ich weiß, ja auch in der Notaufnahme des Krankenhauses. Und mich würde natürlich noch mal interessieren, in, den, in der Pandemie, während der Pandemie einen Arbeitskampf zu beginnen. Also aus meiner Sicht ist es ja erstmal so, da muss, da muss ja viel vorfallen, da muss viel passieren. Äh, welche Gründe waren da ausschlaggebend, dass ihr euch entschlossen habt, dann auch in, der, in dieser Zeit in den Streit zu gehen, in die Auseinandersetzung zu gehen? Um, we uh, had been building toward uh, a strike for a very long time um, based on the conditions that I described before, um, which, uh, you know, in, in the context uh, of U.S. healthcare, it's like all, most other social services in the United States, it's austerity, it's neoliberal austerity, right? That's been the policy for decades. And so what that's done is uh, kind of strangled those social services until they're down to the bare bones um, until, you know, the resources are, are so scarce that, you know, um, it, it, it's, it's not um, unusual for me to walk around at work and my coworkers to walk around at work and see pieces of equipment, life-saving equipment, uh, just missing. Um, to give you an example, uh, recently I had a patient who was uh, dying um, their heart wasn't beating and we had to do CPR and breathe for them. And um, in a room where you normally rush those patients immediately to this room to resuscitate them, um, I reached for the device that you use to help breathe for the patient and it wasn't there. Um, and uh, so, um, you know, uh, the, 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 the pro these problems uh, you know, actually, I'm sorry, Harold. Uh, my 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 brain uh, has blanked a little bit. Could you could you just uh, summarize your question one more time? I want to make sure I answer directly. Naja, vielleicht kann man das ja auch ein bisschen verbinden. Welche konkreten Gründe oder Anlässe hat es gegeben? Also ich habe verstanden, die Infrastruktur, die Technik war nicht vorhanden de facto. Die war kaputt. Die Infrastruktur ist zusammengespart worden. Austerity Programs. Ähm, aber dennoch war, die, war, war dann auch die, also die Wut so groß bei den Beschäftigten, also bei, bei deinen Kolleginnen und Kollegen, dass jetzt gesagt wurde, das kann, kann man jetzt nicht mehr weiter hinnehmen, da muss man jetzt sozusagen auch wirklich was tun. Yes, I understand. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, yes, I, I would say uh, that the strike was inevitable. Um, if the pandemic hadn't happened, we would have most likely 
um, reached the point of strike uh, because of the way the employer was bargaining with us and the way that they've uh, treated us historically over the last about 10 years or so. There, there was a um, leadership uh, running the administration that uh, clear, very clearly had an agenda of union busting and uh, basically they stopped their relationship with, with, with us as a workforce. Um, uh, almost as if, you know, if it, if it were your romantic relationship, just a partner who won't talk to you or respond at all. Um, and uh, the pandemic, I think, accelerated um, that uh, dysfunctional relationship. Um, and the employer was using the pandemic as a way to uh, railroad or fast track um, their aggressive um, union busting and bargaining. Um, they attempted to um, basically tear up and rewrite uh, majority of our contract, um, and I think that the it seems that um, the you know one of the final straws, uh, kind of like the 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 the, the, the as we would say uh, the straw that broke the camel's back, uh, uh, is that the employer proposed started proposing things like um, an end to guaranteed hours, and so what what that means um, in uh, in the United States. Um, we have dwindling amount of secure public sector jobs. And so um, workplaces like mine um, are some of the last places where you uh, can work and have a pension, a guaranteed retirement income, um, or uh, health care that you don't have to pay out of your own pocket for. Um, there's some of the last workplaces like that. And the employer proposed that we start paying for health care. They also proposed that um, if you're a full-time worker um, or even if you're a part-time worker, uh, the employer now would be able to take away work hours whenever they please. And so um, if they were able to, to win that, what that would mean is that I wouldn't know how many hours of work I'm going to be able to get next week or this week or next year. Um, I wouldn't be able to depend on a steady income and a secure income. Um, so they started proposing those sorts of things. And in the context where they're already, you know, short staffing us every day and everyone is working in what feels like a pressure cooker. Um, and then on top of that, you, uh, the pandemic happens and, uh, and we're feeling even more stressed and in even more danger. Uh, you know, people were at the beginning of the pandemic were extremely afraid for their lives and, and the safety of their families. And, uh, and also uh, uh, seeing that their patients were being put unnecessarily in positions um, that were very dangerous. Um, and so uh, we felt like we were in a corner and we had nowhere, nothing else we could do, no other option. And that's why we went on strike during the pandemic. Es würde uns wahrscheinlich auch nochmal alle interessieren, halt eben, wie genau solche Arbeitskämpfe geführt werden in den USA, wo die Unterschiede vielleicht auch sind, was wir davon lernen können. Wie läuft es ab? Wie wirkt er sich konkret aus? Und natürlich die Pandemie. Welche zusätzlichen Probleme gab es da? Wie habt ihr mobilisiert und organisiert den Streik? Und was auch sicher interessant wäre, es ist ja glaube ich, so ein bisschen reingefallen noch in den Wahlkampf, in den Präsidentschaftswahlkampf. Hat der, hat der in irgendeiner Form auch eine Rolle gespielt, der Präsidentschaftswahlkampf? Harald, uh, the interpreter is saying he can't uh, hear you. He's having a technical problem. Hört er mich jetzt? Ja, dann wiederhole ich nochmal ganz kurz. Also es ist natürlich jetzt die spannende Frage, wie genau solche Arbeitskämpfe geführt werden in den USA, was wir davon auch lernen können unter Umständen. Wie funktioniert so ein Streik in der Vorbereitung? Wie läuft er ab? Wie wirkt es sich aus? Ähm, Harald, ähm, du bist, der, der Übersetzer hat gerade ein Problem, ähm, der kann dich nicht hören. Das muss erst kurz gelöst werden. Ah. Aber es liegt nicht an mir, ich habe mein Mikrofon schon an. Genau. Okay, jetzt nochmal bitte. Okay. Also wir sind halt gespannt darauf, wie halt so ein Streik dann in, den, in einem Krankenhaus in den USA abläuft, äh, wie er sich auswirkt, wie er vorbereitet wird vor allen Dingen, also wie wird organisiert und mobilisiert. 
Ähm, hat, wie, welche Auswirkungen hat die Pandemie dabei gehabt? Und weil das ja in der Zeit war, wo der Präsidentschaftswahlkampf auch war, hat in irgendeiner Form der Wahlkampf, der Präsidentschaftswahlkampf auch eine Rolle gespielt und wenn ja, welche? Um, uh, very good questions. Um, and what I would say is that um, uh, Our strike was uh, very, very intentionally organized. Um, we, uh, even before our bargaining team was elected from among our membership, um, the uh, myself and my coworkers who are elected leaders of our part of the union, um, we uh, sat down and talked about um, what would it take for us to win a good contract. Um, and and uh, also once the bargaining team was elected, Uh, which is uh, at the end of 2019, um, we uh, just talked about, you know, um, what do our members want? Um, we, we had a survey of the membership uh, and we used that to prioritize um, and to understand uh, what, what uh, the majority of people wanted to win in the contract and what they cared about and what was important to them to preserve in the contract. And we very quickly realized that um, the structure of our county public health system uh, was uh, it, that the only way that we'd be able to win a good contract and keep things like uh, guaranteed health care for our, our members um, would be to uh, force the county to, to uh, take uh, complete control of the public health system. Um, and here I'll explain uh, what I mean by that because we have a very unusual um, system. Um, and this, you know, uh, it, it actually is a, a very direct result of uh, some neoliberal thinking um, uh, in, the, in the county about 20 years ago. Um, and the way it works is that um, we are a public uh, health system for the purposes of labor law and for the purposes of um, uh, legal licensing and uh, But the county um, formally gave up control uh, of our health system uh, and turned it into an independent public uh, agency. Um, and what that did is it removed the county's obligation to fund it. Um, and it also removed the county's, um, some of the county's obligation uh, to be accountable for what happens in its own uh, public health system. So we're in the position of taking care of all of the patients in the county who can't afford the private hospitals, um, but the county doesn't have to fund it or pay for it in the way that it normally would. Um, and also the county elected officials act as if they don't have to be accountable for what happens. Um, and we realized that this situation was untenable. Our employer um, has is basically forced to act like a private sector Uh, non-profit, asking for donations, doing fundraisers, um, and making corporate partnerships uh, in order to pay for public health care. Um, uh, and it's, it's really, uh, you know, it, it has contributed greatly um, to the, condition, the austerity working conditions that I was describing. Um, and what it means is that uh, where, uh, when the county normally would just provide funding, say, to buy equipment, bandages, uh, EKG machines, um, what instead happens is that, that our employer, our hospital system, has to go to the county with hat in hand and say, please give us a loan. And so our public hospital system is in deep debt to the county, and the county is pressuring it to pay back the loans and cut the budget. So we realized that in this situation, um, we needed to force the county to be accountable and to take back direct control of the hospital system. Um, and that was the only way we're going to be able to win a good contract for our members or change anything in the hospital system. Um, and so the way that we organized to do this is that we, um, we had the survey that I, I mentioned, um, and then... Um, some of us uh, started very intentionally organizing by going out and having one-on-one -on -one conversations in the workplace um, over uh, about a year of time, uh, building up to the strike. Um, first, we tried to establish a presence. 
um, just so people were familiar with, uh, with us, coworkers, maybe from a different workplace. Um, we helped people with uh, fights on the shop floor against their bosses, things that they were upset about in various departments, um, and gained people's trust and continued to come back and have one-on-one -on -one conversations. We used um, pretty much any opportunity or tool that we could think of uh, to have a reason to have these one-on-one -on -one conversations. Sometimes it would be that we're organizing uh, a positive event. You know, we're going to bring uh, lunch and gather everyone to talk about what you want to see in your next contract. And sometimes it would be something that was, uh, you know, we're gathering people to fight management um, or we're signing, uh, getting people to sign a petition to get the county to take us over. Um, we... Um, we had some other opportunities that we were able to use. Um, for example, at the beginning of the pandemic, the American media was very interested um, in uh, what was happening inside of hospitals, and we were able to get a lot of um, regional and some national media attention um, about our struggles. Um, and that became a vehicle for reaching more of our coworkers um, and also uh, for some of our coworkers stepping up and doing. Uh, you know, their first union activity, um, for some people, it was helping uh, coordinate donations of protective equipment or food um, or uh, speaking to the media uh, about conditions that, uh, you know, uh, had already existed, but now people felt even more strongly about. Um, and then uh, you were asking also about um, what what was different uh, about doing this during the pandemic. Um it was it, uh, it dramatically changed uh, how we did this, and in some uh, strange ways, um, uh, I think it motivated uh, good things for us. Um, one of those is that our union staffers, their um, field representatives, that um, most of their work is representing workers who are disciplined or um, uh, you know have a grievance, um, uh, and. Their um, way of working and what they're used to is what we would call the service model, uh, service mindset. They're used to, to um, you know, I'm here to help you fix your problem. And we realized that that wasn't going to help us get to a strike. Um, because of the pandemic, those people who are not hospital employees were not allowed to go inside of the buildings and they had to stay home. And so we realized we're going to have to do all the organizing work ourselves and we won't have any help from our, um, our paid union representatives. So we're gonna have to, in addition to our own jobs, uh, spend a lot of time organizing, and we did. Um, and so all the organizing was done by uh, us, the workers. Um, that's not ideal. Uh, it's, it's good to have people who are paid um, to, to do it and have more time and can focus. Um, but we had, we had to do it this way. We had no other way to do it. Um, and it worked and it motivated us and it uh, caused us to learn uh, better how to organize uh, our coworkers. Um, and uh, yeah, what I would say is that, uh, you know, in, in summary, uh, it took a lot of intention. Um, we got a huge amount of inspiration and ideas from uh, especially the teachers, public school teacher strikes that have been happening in the United States. Um, we got uh, good advice uh, from people that were involved in those strikes. Um, some of them kind of consulted on our campaigns and gave us ideas. Um, we also got good advice uh, from people in other unions um, who successfully carried out strikes um, uh, or uh, campaigns, uh, in particular, the New York State Nurses. Um, that's my old union. Um, I still know people there, and we were able to, to talk to them. Jane McLevy um, gave us some advice in the buildup um, and during. Um, and so, yeah, that's, I'd say that's how we did it. Ja, vielen Dank für die Eindrücke. Zwei, zwei Punkte noch hätte ich ganz gerne gewusst. Das eine, du hast gerade auch erwähnt, um, Union Busting. Um, mich würde noch mal interessieren, wie stark das gewesen ist, ob da Streikbrecher eingesetzt worden sind, wie ihr damit umgegangen seid, wie ihr das gehandelt habt. Und das Zweite, was ich gerade noch gefragt hatte, jetzt im politischen Kontext, hat in irgendeiner Form auch der Wahlkampf eine Rolle gespielt, also der Präsidentschaftswahlkampf?
Um, uh, yes, so uh, the, the employer used a lot of um, uh, union busting tactics in the buildup to the strike. Um, and um, even before our campaign, we're employing lots of union busting. The, the, the kind of union busting they were doing is not the most aggressive that you see in the United States. Um, uh, in the public sector where I work, um, you don't tend to see, uh, for example, employers hiring um, uh, union busting uh, consulting firms or law firms. Um, that is still politically not popular uh, in, the, in most of the United States. And so, for example, in, here in California, um, the local government would uh, be in political trouble um, if they were to do that, to spend money on something like that. However, um, most of what we saw was a, a fairly disorganized uh, kind of neglect or um, failure to respond. Um, uh, also, some um, also very disorganized, but uh, some specific things. For example, um, uh, the employer um, publicly shamed and then terminated uh, a, a nurse uh, who um, posted on social media and shared with their coworkers uh, a photo of them wearing a garbage bag, a, a, a plastic trash bag, uh, because the hospital didn't provide them with protective equipment for a patient who had an infectious disease. Um, uh, I participated as well in publicizing that, um, and we have an ongoing um, battle with the employer about that situation. We're still working on winning uh, that nurse's job back. Um, and uh, that had a chilling effect on our membership, just like lots of other actions uh, did. Um, uh, and uh, the public shaming uh, took the effect also of the employer uh, playing the race card. Um, so uh, our former CEO who resigned after our strike uh, as a result of our strike, um, was African American, uh, and um, our membership very broadly uh, hated him. And I'll, I'll say also, our membership is a majority uh, people of color, a uh, large amount of uh, people who are African American, um, actually a little slightly higher um, than the proportion that are of the American population. Um, but the employer, in a very cynical way, um, would play a, a very in a very shallow and cynical way. Would play the race card, so they would put uh, you know public uh, social media posts and um, press releases and out to politicians that the union is racist because they're criticizing the the uh, African American CEO, um, or that uh, you know John the union chapter president is a white male, um, and. Uh, uh, um, they would find, uh, you know, someone in the comments on the social media who was objectionable, some random person on the Internet, and say that uh, they're associated with the union and the union is racist because a random person in the comments uh, said something vulgar. Um, and so is that sort of union busting as well as um, uh, things like, for example, refusing to recognize um, the, the contract uh, that has just that had expired last March um, and saying that it wasn't legitimate and writing their own version of it unilaterally without bargaining, uh, things like that. And then as far as um, how did the Trump presidency or, uh, affect uh, in the presidential election affect um, our strike, um, I don't think it uh, – the, I didn't – it didn't seem to directly affect it. Um, we had, you know, we have a, a small portion of our workforce who are um, um, who are Trump supporters um, and who will talk about it at work. Um, and many of them supported and participated in the strike. Um, I think that one of the most important um, things for for leftists about union work is that it allows us to connect um, uh, political organizing with people's real conditions and direct self-interest. Um, and so, uh, you know, myself and, and many of my uh, fellow union activists are able to have conversations with people that we disagree with about national politics um, or about many other things, um, but we can agree that uh, it's not uh, fair for our patients when we don't have equipment or um, it's not okay for our boss to cut our health care. Uh, and so, you know, I, 
I don't think that it directly did. I, I would say that maybe um, it's possible that we had higher participation because um, the majority of people in this region and in the United States were um, feeling anxiety about getting Trump out of office because he's caused so much instability and has done so many very obviously um, negative, awful things um, that have been very apparent in the media. Uh, but otherwise, I don't think that the election directly affected uh, our campaign very much. Ja, danke schön. Ich würde noch ganz gerne natürlich wissen, wie es denn ausgegangen ist, der Streik insgesamt. Ähm, wurden die Forderungen erfüllt? Wie wurden sie erfüllt? Und ich habe gerade noch gesehen in der, im Chat, äh, das ist vielleicht am Anfang untergegangen, weiß ich nicht genau, ähm, da wurde nochmal gefragt, wie deine genaue äh, Berufsbezeichnung ist, also was du beruflich machst und was deine Funktion bei der Gewerkschaft ist. Das ist noch im Chat jetzt gerade eine Frage gewesen. Wahrscheinlich ist am Anfang nicht übersetzt worden. Um, Harald, uh, the interpreter is asking, uh, what is the second question from the chat? Uh, he didn't catch that. Okay. Also im Chat war nochmal die Frage nach der Berufsbezeichnung. Also Beruf, das ist ja Krankenpfleger, ähm, wohl in der Notaufnahme und dann noch die Funktion bei der Gewerkschaft, dass du vielleicht ein paar Worte dazu nochmal sagst. Uh, okay, thank you. Um, yes, uh, I am a registered nurse uh, in the emergency department at um, the biggest facility of our part of the union, uh, of our county health system. Um, and I take care of uh, patients who, um, you know, uh, have had, I would say, have had the worst day of their life. Um, I really enjoy my job. I love it. Uh, a lot of teamwork. Um, uh, and um, we're, we're kind of well known, I think, in the region for You know, this is the place you go if you get uh, shot or run over by a car or fall from a building. We're the ones who take care of you. Um, and my position in the union is um, I am chapter president. Um, and so um, just, just to give people a description for the context, uh, our union is uh, part of SEIU International, um, which uh, in the United States is uh, – is mostly composed of public sector workers um, at the, the state and county and city level, as well as uh, many other service sector and some um, uh, industrial manufacturing, but uh, mostly service sector workers. Um, and our local uh, part of the union is about 65,000 workers um, and is mostly composed of those kinds of service sector um, local government workers. Uh, uh, similar to the kind of job I do, but also um, administrative roles. Um, for example, um, other parts of our local union include um, the county government workers who um, help people, uh, you know, sign up for social benefits. Um, it includes nonprofit workers in um, clinics uh, and other kinds of nonprofits. Uh, the regional public transport. Um, workers, some of them are in our union, and our portion of the union, the one that uh, the part that I'm uh, the president of, uh, is uh, all almost all of the workers uh, that work for our county hospital system. So there's about 3,200 of us, um, and it's uh, it's pretty large ge county geographically. So if I were to drive from um, you know one end uh, uh, of our territory to the farthest workplace. It would take me about 45 minutes or an hour. Um, and just to describe some of these places, we have the county psychiatric hospital. Um, uh, it's the only place in the county where anyone can get psychiatric care. Um, so if someone is suicidal, that's the place that they'll go. Um, or if they're you know violent, um, that's where they'll end up. Uh, we also have the large um, county trauma center where I work, uh, the, the biggest hospital. Um, 
to uh, smaller community hospitals, um, a nursing home, a rehab, and then three very large um, clinic complexes, which are the only place where you can get um, health care in the county if you don't have private insurance, which is a, uh, a very large number of the people in the county. Um, and Harold, now I apologize. I've had too much coffee and I forgot the first part of your question that was not from the chat. It's no problem, John. Uh, it's, uh, <laughs> ich kann ja im Deutschen. <laughs> Entschuldigung, uh, kein Problem, überhaupt gar kein Problem. Uh, ich würde natürlich noch mal interessieren, wie das jetzt mit dem Kampf ausgegangen ist, mit dem Streik. Wurden die Forderungen erfüllt? Uh, hat das mit der Rekommunalisierung geklappt? Um, Nurse to patient ratios, habt ihr da was durchsetzen können? Also in dem Verhältnis halt eben äh, von äh, Pflegekraft zu den Patienten. Ähm, das würde mich interessieren. Ähm, Soweit erstmal. Genau, dann habe ich noch eine, eine Frage zusätzlich und dann sind wir im zweiten Teil, denke ich. Yes, uh, now I remember. Uh, so, yes, it was successful. Um, it did not achieve all of those goals, however, um, in a very dramatic fashion, uh, and uh, it, it has been about 20 years since the last uh, strike at this um, employer, um, and that strike uh, was a uh, one-day strike, um, which achieved uh, more modest gains. Um, you know, basically the employer was saying no to some of the usual things that workers bargain about, wage increases and things like that. And um, workers at that time in the early 2000s were able to win those things. This uh, strike um, had, I would call it a large success, but with some frustration um, and uh, a few very obvious uh, goals that are still out there. And I'll tell you what I'm anticipating uh, we, we might do next. Um, and so um, when our strike uh, finished after five days, um, there, there wasn't an immediate effect. However, you know, being back in the workplace felt very different, I think, for most people. Um, people felt like they had more power um, because they had just gone on strike and, you know, people usually are afraid about losing their job and no one lost their job. Um, and uh, management clearly had a different attitude. Um, uh, shortly after the strike, um, uh, well, well, actually, sorry, uh, to go back a little bit, during the strike, um, we had uh, enough, pre we put on enough pressure and enough success to get the county elected officials to come out to the picket line um, and to announce that they were going to take over the hospital system. Uh, and that was uh, the most euphoric moment of the whole strike. People were cheering and dancing in the street. Um, I think everyone had uh, was so used to the austerity that it had become normal and it didn't feel like anything could change. And so this was a big moment. Um, of course, we immediately realized we need to consolidate this uh, win and make sure that it actually happens. Um, and it has not fully happened. However, what did happen uh, about a week or two after the strike is that the county elected officials held a public meeting um, and uh, and they put a proposal on the table to um, tell the, the the hospital board. So these are elect; these are not not elected officials, but appointed um, who are responsible for running the hospital system. To tell them uh, that they must resign uh, or they'll be terminated; they'll be fired. And so that was very exciting for us, um, and we prepared. Uh, a lot of our workers to give public comment, to put pressure. Um, we did lobbying beforehand, but we also prepared during the meeting to give lots of public comment to pressure the county elected officials to, to vote yes, to, to fire the, the hospital leadership. Um, we are familiar with doing this. We do it a lot. Um, and usually the employer doesn't do the same thing. But this time, the employer lined up all of their executives and ma as much management as they could get to agree to do it. And they also lined up um, a lot of their private contractors. And because this is neoliberal austerity, there's lots of uh, very shady uh, kind of cut rate discount uh, private contractors. And um, because most of our people work, uh, 
they only have a small amount of time during the day where they could give pu public comment in a meeting. And so a lot of our people that were signed up to give public comment as this meeting went on for hours and hours uh, were not able to stay. And we felt very crestfallen, very disappointed because the employer had manager after manager saying, the CEO of the hospital was great and he took me to lunch and I think he's wonderful and things are fine. Um, uh, but we realized after about uh, half a dozen of the employer's representatives speaking in this public meeting that they are um, shooting themselves in the foot. They are uh, they, they're, they're doing the opposite of what they intended to do because it's becoming with every um, person who gives comment on behalf of the employer, they're making it more and more obvious how disconnected they are from the reality that's going on. Um, because when the uh, parking lot contractor says, you know, like, I, uh, you know, uh, they give me a million dollars and I uh, run the parking lots and I think the CEO is wonderful. You're not going to believe them when the next person that speaks is a nurse who says, like, my patient died and I couldn't find supplies to, to save their life. Um, and uh, even the, the politicians who were the ones who were going to vote about this, even the politicians who were on the employer's side, you could see their faces changing and becoming annoyed. Um, and in the end, they voted to fire the hospital trustees um, and to bring in new trustees. And the new trustees are, are there now. They've been seated. And we've had, through a lot of uh, lobbying and the strike, um, influence over who some of them are. And so now for the first time, we have two um, SEIU union nurses on the, on the board of trustees, which is amazing for us. And so we have very close relationships with them and work with them uh, very carefully now. Um, and so we have some political power on the hospital board. Um, uh, the, many of the top executives have now resigned or been forced out. Um, and I think there are still more to come. Um, and the county is still uh, saying that it's committed to changing the governance in, in a permanent way. Um, we see signs that they are backpedaling. They're, they're pulling back on their commitment to do that. And um, what I anticipate is that they're going to do it halfway, kind of like uh, we've seen reform to American health care where you know, Obama or Clinton will come out and say uh, universal health care, and then they walk it back and do a half measure that allows the neoliberalism to continue. That's what I'm anticipating. And so I'm anticipating that in our next contract campaign, um, that we will have to fight again and possibly strike to force the county to, uh, in a legitimate way, take over. Um, so, so that's uh, kind of what we've achieved. At the bargaining table, the employer during the strike uh, fired its uh, bargaining team, got rid of them. Uh, fired their chief negotiator and took the other people off the team and replaced them with um, uh, someone from outside who has a reputation in our region for um, for helping employers make peace with their workforce. Uh, and we have been winning our demands one after another. Um, the frustrating part of this has been that because of the pandemic, we're only able to do the bargaining online, just like we're having this panel right now. Uh, we can't do it in person. And so that has slowed down the pace of the bargaining. Uh, at the beginning, many of us were anticipating we're going to have a strike and it's going to force a week of bargaining to finish the contract. But we've been um, going for months now since the strike. We're anticipating, though, being done in the next few weeks. Um, and uh, so, yes, the, the strike has caused some wins. However, it's been frustrating that material wins for our workforce um, haven't, haven't happened yet that would help drive home the lessons for what power they have and what the strike can do. Ich habe noch eine Frage im Chat jetzt gesehen, die ich noch mal weitergeben möchte. Ich weiß nicht, AW, Namen weiß ich jetzt nicht, aber da wird gefragt, wie ihr es organisiert habt, dass die Pflegekräfte, die streiken wollen, die Stationen verlassen konnten, ohne die Drohung des Arbeitgebers, dass ihr die Patienten gefährdet. Und äh, ob alle Berufsgruppen, also auch die Funktionsdienste und Ähnliches mitgestreikt haben. Uh, 
Uh, very good question, and it's one that we struggled with at the beginning, and then we, I think, we figured it out pretty well. Um, the uh, non uh, non bedside, non clinical workers um, are a large portion of our membership, um, and for them, it was much easier, obviously, to go on strike. Um, this, uh, it, you know, wasn't a dilemma for them. Obviously, they didn't have to directly walk away from patients. Um, and so it was rel more more easy to organize those workers um, to walk out. Uh, for the clinical workers, this question did come up a lot, but uh, I think that the you know basically uh, we did feel like we were uh, backed against the wall or backed into a corner and had no pathway out of it. And and the you know being in that position, the position is of already not being able to take care of our patients adequately. It's of already not being safe, um, already having the employer um, not follow or, you know, fail to follow our contract, fail to pay people correctly, uh, terminate people without cause, um, fail to give them their, you know, um, due process rights uh, when they're disciplined, um, and fail to provide um, the, just the basic support uh, that you need to run a healthcare system. I mean, I'll give you one um example that persists to this day is that uh, over the time that I've worked at this workplace, um, we have had training for people like me, nurses who do critical care work and take care of uh, the sickest dying patients. Training has been uh, basically completely eliminated. And so um, the way that it is in the workplace, when new things happen in the medical field or when a new thing comes along, just like COVID-19, we have zero in-person training at all. All it is is email or a few, you know, PowerPoint slides on a computer. Um, with no, the employer is not funding time to train. They also terminated all of the people who do the training and education, and so there are no people with expertise and training left at the health system. They're just gone. Uh, it's it's just an austerity measure. They're they're gone. There's no provision for training, and so. We have to figure it out ourselves, which is very dangerous. Um, and so, uh, you know, that's the position that we are in and that we have been in for a long time. And so I think people felt like we have no choice but to go on strike. If we want conditions to improve for our patients, if we want to provide um, actual, adequate, or high-quality patient care, we have to go on strike. We have no choice. Um, However, um, we, we did, you know, uh, it, it, to leave uh, the emergency department where I work uh, completely empty of nurses and, uh, you know, and other healthcare workers obviously would be a problem because um, there are patients in there all the time. It's never empty for sure. It's, it's always full. Um, and every single day uh, we have p patients who are injured uh, and sick coming in, um, you know, uh, often hundreds of them. And so uh, those kind of vital services, um, we actually did something very interesting um, that our legal team uh, kind of uh, came up with and innovated, um, which is using, um, and let me just explain some context, is that um, it seems from the surface, from the beginning, that the strongest, most militant position to take would be, uh, we are going to go on strike, we're not going to tell you when, and we're all walking out. An employer, you know, you have to figure it out. Uh, you know, boss, you got to figure it out. Um, that uh, puts us in a position, you know, especially because we're public sector. Um, uh, the top priority of the strike is not uh, hurting the profits of the employer because this is a public employer. They're publicly funded um, or funded by donation in our case, too. Um, and so their funding will continue to come in. Uh, and so we're not hurting the profit very much. We're not hurting, hurting the revenue very much. Actually, what we're doing is we're trying to win public support. Um, so it's, a, it's about political pressure and public support, which we won. We were successful in doing that. And so be, doing that sort of militant approach where we're not giving notice and we don't care what happens, um, doesn't probably, you know, we were anticipating that would not help us win public support. Um, on the surface, it seems like it's a less militant position to bargain ahead of time about some people crossing the picket line. However, um, our attorneys helped us come up with a very interesting strategy that 
uh, I believe, actually helped us build the union uh, and um, recruit workers that were not involved, who are now involved, um, and put us in a stronger position and made the employer weaker. And what we did is that we approached the employer before they did anything at all and said, we're giving you advance notice of our strike so you have time to prepare because we care about the patients even though you don't. Um, and we want to bargain with you about some people getting a pass, like a physical pass, to cross the picket line with our permission. Um, and we're going to bargain with you about uh, who that is and under what conditions. And um, in order to do that, we had to draw in workers who had expertise in various departments about what are the, the basic things that you need in that department to keep it safe during the strike. Um, and so we had, uh, we had day and night negotiations over a weekend with the employer and we fought about it um, and we ended up um, making an agreement about this. Uh, and the way that it worked in the end is that during the strike, we had workers who had agreed ahead of time uh, with, with a very careful plan um, to go inside. And it wasn't very many workers. So we have 3,200 um, workers that we represent, which is almost everyone that works in the hospital system. And this was around, um, I think, about 50 people, mostly at the psychiatric hospital, um, a very small amount in the emergency department. And the employer... Um, uh, said that they were planning to bring in scabs, replacement workers in some other places. Um, and so we said, oh, well, you're going to bring in scabs. Well, we don't need to provide replacements. Um, and so the way that it worked for these people when the picket line was happening is that they would walk up to the picket line, they would find the picket captain, and they would uh, say, I am, you know, uh, I am so-and-so, uh, my name is Joe, and I'm supposed to go in now for a shift. We would stop the picket line, gather everyone around, um, hand them a pass, explain to the crowd what was happening and that these people were helping make the strike stronger and keeping patients safe because the employer doesn't know how to do that. Um, and everyone would cheer and we would tell them, you know, come out and join us on your break. Uh, we're going to have food for you. Come and find us. And they would come out. They'd wear their union T-shirt inside the building um, and walk around with their head held high and proud of what they were doing to help the strike. Um, it was a really good, it was a very good sign to us when we were planning this, that in some departments, it was very hard to find anyone who would agree to cross the picket line. Um, uh, one department, for example, um, where we were very uh, pleasantly surprised is the intensive care unit, um, who normally uh, were not very involved in anything uh, with the union and uh, because we did some very intentional organizing work in there in preparation for the strike, by the time we were preparing for the strike, everyone we asked in the whole department said, I'm not crossing the picket line. I will not sign up for a picket line pass. And we had to beg people, please, we need a few nurses just to keep the patients safe. Um, and they were very unhappy about it. And so we had to do a lot of one-on-one -on -one talking uh, to get them to agree. Um, so that strategy, it was very frustrating to do. To carry out, um, but in the end, I think it, it helped make the strike stronger. Ja, ich würde jetzt ganz gerne dann überleiten den zweiten Teil, also Wortmeldungen. Ähm, wie gesagt, wir machen eine quotierte Redeliste. Ähm, wenn ich jemand dann aufrufe, der sich gemeldet hat, wir haben ja eine Wortmeldung bereits, ähm, dann wird es freigeschalten und dann könnt ihr eure Frage entsprechend stellen. Den, das Mikrofon müsst ihr selber einschalten dann. Kamera schalten wir nicht automatisch ein. Wenn ihr einen Beitrag mit Bild haben wollt, müsst ihr selber die Kamera einschalten. Bitte macht die Beiträge relativ kurz, wenn es geht. Und es war jetzt, äh, wenn ich es richtig sehe, Marie als Erste dran, oder? Genau. Can you hear me? Sorry, do you hear me? Yeah, ja, also eigentlich hören wir dich, oder? Yeah? All right. We can hear you. <laughs> okay. Um, John, first of all, thanks for all the insights and uh, your very nice description of what you did. And congratulations for what you achieved with your strike and also good luck for the future. Um, 
most of my question you already answered, um, but uh, I'd like to know um, how did you motivate? Because you you yourself said, yes, you love your job and you care for the patients. Of course you do. That's expected in the care sector. But also it's uh, often used against nurses, like in Germany, that you like your job. You not... Uh, allowed to complain about your job and I think that's uh, in Germany uh, like an ethical or moral uh, problem also for the nurses and all the health staff to strike and so I would like uh, on, on, a, on that argue, uh, like on, on a convincing level how, how you did that and what are like arguments and then I would also be interested in um, how or like how much or which per percentage of the staff members did participate and on what career level because uh, I, I think probably yeah, I'd like to know that. <laughs> thank you so much. Uh, good questions. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so um, we had very broad participation. Um, And uh, just uh, to tell you, you know, about a little bit more about the workforce, so you know who went on strike. Um, about 900 of us are nurses, like myself, um, and the majority of the workforce. Um, again, the total around 3,200. The majority of the workforce uh, are um, not nurses. Uh, they are uh, about 200 and di 200 different job classifications. It's Everyone in the hospital and clinics that's not a doctor or a manager, pretty much. So everyone from the housekeepers to the social workers, uh, pharmacists, uh, pharmacy technicians, respiratory therapists, food service workers, um, cashiers uh, in the, the cafeteria, um, uh, many, many different departments of people who do administrative work, you know, our, our privatized healthcare system is very complex, and so there's a lot of um, uh, administrative workers who handle paperwork and billing and um, things like that. Um, uh, uh, many, many other workers uh, who are not nurses. Um, the participation, uh, I would say, was um, the most enthusiastic um, from uh, some of our lower wage workers um, for whom um, The conditions are, I would say, even worse than for people like myself, um, who are, you know, uh, in America, we would say are professionals or are licensed certified. Um, and the employer gets away with treating them, uh, I think, even on a personal level, uh, much more disrespectfully. Um, and uh, but but the participation was broad. Um, we were able, you know, the, the amount of people that crossed the picket line and went to work was small enough that we were able to make what we think is a pretty accurate list of people who did, um, didn't participate in the strike. Um, and that list uh, was fairly small, less than 100 people. Um, uh, so participation was, was very high. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, uh, we found uh, that the biggest motivations seemed to be negative motivations, that the employer was going to take things away or uh, make things even worse for people. Um, and those seem to be, you know, when we would have one-on-one -on -one conversations with workers who previously weren't interested in union activity or were skeptical of the strike or participation, um, when we would tell them things like, the employer is planning to end your guaranteed work hours. The employer is planning to make you start paying for healthcare. They would say, No, like not, no, hell no, I'm going on strike. And so those things were big motivators for people. Um, and I think that um, I can understand what you're describing um, and have encountered that very much in the workplace, a sense of responsibility for patients. Um, and what I would describe also as um, uh, service workers putting themselves in the position of being responsible for things that actually the employer should be responsible for. And so I think that a lot of our preparation, um, our public uh, events, rallies, one-on-one -on -one conversations included um, 
repeatedly and very deliberately helping people through thinking about separating what they are responsible to do at work and what the employer is responsible for. And so when people would say, but I feel bad for the patients because, you know, I'm walking out, um, we would uh, find something that they were unhappy about at work. And there are many things to be unhappy about in any workplace and certainly at ours. You know, uh, you know, uh, for a real example, I can't find a thermometer to take a patient's temperature. I had to walk around for 10 minutes. That's an example from my shift yesterday. Um, if somebody said, geez, you know, I'm really annoyed, I can't find a thermometer, you say, well, whose responsibility is it to provide enough thermometers so we can take people's temperatures? In an emergency department where some people have a temperature that's uh, so high that they might die if we don't take care of them sick uh, quickly. Um, and you get them to, to answer the question themselves and think about, oh, it's not my responsibility to make sure that that's, th that's there. It's, it's my boss's responsibility. It's the employer's responsibility. And they haven't been doing it for years. Well, what can we do about it? You know, we can complain, but that doesn't do anything. We've been complaining for years. The only thing left to do is to walk out. We've tried everything else. Um, and everybody else is going to do it. You ready? You're going to join us? And so people would be motivated. But it did take a lot of preparation. Um, I would say uh, even maybe two or three months before the strike, um, if we had all of a sudden called a strike vote, um, people would not have voted, a majority of people probably would not have voted yes because they would have been un felt uncertain. But we did a lot of very in, um, intentional and intensive preparation uh, for the strike vote and for the strike itself that we had high participation. The strike vote itself, I think, was um, another is another good example of how we, um, we, we used every opportunity we could um, to prepare people. And so basically it was, um, it was practice for the strike. Um, we had people walk away from their job uh, just for a few minutes to go and vote. And so they had the experience of feeling what it was like to walk out uh, just for even if, if it was for a minute and to do something in a group um, and to do it very publicly and dramatically. We had um, at, at our biggest hospital where I work at Highland, we um, most of the buildings face a very large courtyard and they have uh, windows on all the floors looking out at the courtyard. And so we put the ballot box in the middle of the courtyard. And because it's outdoors, you know, people can uh, be in a bigger group. There's a bigger space. People can stay uh, distant from each other, but still you can see visually it's a big group of people. And all day management was watching people line up with purple, you know, get purple T-shirts and put them on and put a, a big ballot in a box. Uh, and uh, I think it was very scary for management and it made them backpedal um, and, and, and start to panic. Uh, and it helped our members feel more prepared uh, and be ready to, to do that in a more dramatic fashion. Um, I'm happy to, happy to answer more questions about, about that if people have them. Wie habt ihr den Streik finanziert? Welche Finanzierungsmöglichkeiten habt ihr gehabt? Um, we, um, uh, so we, we had a budget, uh, for the campaign, um, that was, uh, paid from our union dues, um, which, uh, it is different for different sections of our workforce, but roughly, uh, one, 1% 1 to 2% of our gross, uh, pay. Um, we had a budget, uh, for the whole campaign and support from our larger local union to do it. Um, our current uh, local leadership um, uh, had not experienced a strike like this before or preparation like this before, um, but was friendly to it, um, or at least, um, you know, um, at, the, at the very least neutral toward it um, and kind of, you know, was interested in supporting us and watching what happened um, and um, support in, in many different forms, including that budget was, was provided to us. Um, to do our work. Some of the support was um, frustrating. Uh, for example, um, I was talking earlier about our union staffers who, um, it's very clear to us, don't have an understanding how to do the work to organize uh, workers for something like this. And in many ways, 
uh, were frustrated and uh, and not able to help, um, or were uh, unhappy and sort of fighting our efforts uh, because they didn't understand it. Um, but most of the support um, uh, was extremely helpful. Um, it, it support in labor during the strike itself. You know, we had um, union staffers from other parts of the union uh, got reassigned to help with our strike. Uh, you know, to bring picket signs and equipment and um, speakers, and um, and we did have quite a bit of funding. Um, we we did um, also did a public fundraiser um, to raise what we called a relief fund for workers who um, basically we used it as an organizing tool. So um, when we would encounter workers um, before the strike who would say, "I want to go on strike." But uh, I won't be able to pay for groceries. I won't be able to pay my bills. I have um, an elderly family member who I take care of, and I have to have my full paycheck. Um, we, you know, so, uh, sometimes we knew that this was a bluff. We knew that this was a, an excuse, a reason to not have to do something that is stressful and challenging um, and, um, and feels like a conflict with your employer. Uh, and so we wanted to not allow that opportunity for that to be a bluff. Um, and so we raised a relief fund to, um, to cover uh, pay for anyone that's in that situation. And we were able to raise uh, about $60,000 and to help out um, about 60 people um, who needed that money. Uh, and um, we were able to get a contribution as well from the, the, the union local to match what we, what we raised. Um, uh, the local labor council, which is the uh, kind of county coalition of all of the unions in the county, um, helped a great deal in some of this organizing um, and, and a little bit in the funding, um, as well as helping coordinate uh, some of our political efforts, our lobbying and pressuring the county. Um, and so that, that's how the funding worked. Ja, vielen Dank. Dann habe ich noch den Thomas Meissner drin, wenn er die Frage stelle, selber stellen möchte. Muss er sein Mikro einschalten. Wenn er noch drin ist. Ja. Ja, okay. Hi John. How did uh, the ordinary citizens react to the strike? Did they even notice the strike? And uh, was the strike topic in public and social media? Thank you for answer. That's a great question. Um, we uh, understood, um, kind of, we figured out in the middle of our campaign that, um, that our main objective was to win the support of the public. And, um, you know, we learned that from the lessons that uh, teachers have learned over the years in, in America. Um, there's a history of uh, teacher strikes in the 1970s and 1980s where teachers were very visibly kind of fighting the public, basically fighting um, groups of parents. Um, and the, um, you know, the, the uh, sort of... Um, anti-union liberal politicians at the time were able to basically make an alliance with the disgruntled and upset uh, parents to fight the teachers unions and, and union bust. Um, and that, that was a big lesson, I think, for teachers unions who, you know, starting with the Chicago teachers in 2000 and uh, I believe it was 2012, um, learned the lesson that there is a great amount of strength, potential strength in um, and lining up teachers' demands also with uh, public good. Um, and so we learned that that's, that needs to be number one priority for us. And so um, I think, you know, one of the challenges inside of the union when you're organizing is that uh, I, you know, I, I have principles about connecting with people's self-interest. I think that's very important. And so, but uh, individual people, especially here in America, um, are not familiar, often familiar with connecting their own self-interest with other people's self-interest, with having solidarity. And so I think that our task often is helping people um, reach a point where they can have solidarity with their coworkers or with the public. 
And the strike, um, our strike, was, I think, a physical example of people doing that, right? whether they know it or not. Um, and so that was the difficult work inside the union, was helping people um, speak in a, about their problems at work in terms uh, about how their problems affect the public and, and the patients. Um, and, uh, and so I think in, in, in doing that, we were, I think, pretty successful in, in doing that. So, for example, um, the media spoke to uh, many of our members who we didn't prepare uh, to speak to the media. And for the most part, those workers were able to speak to the media on the terms of instead of um, the boss is treating me unfairly, uh, talking about, for example, um, uh, the employer isn't providing us with clothing for homeless patients to wear or for the victims of uh, you know accidents whose clothing has been cut or is bloody or is soiled. The employer is not providing us with clothing to give those patients when they leave the hospital. And so these patients are walking out of the hospital with no pants, uh, with no shoes. And uh, I don't feel good taking care of people like that. And they need to provide this. It's been a problem for years. And it's not okay. And so a lot of our members, I think, learned how to speak in that way, uh, to connect their own problems with problems of patients. Um, and we did win over public support. Um, we laid some groundwork for it and got a little bit of notoriety at the beginning of the pandemic before um, the contract campaign became public um, because there was so much media and public attention about uh, protective equipment and about what was happening inside of hospitals. And we won a lot of um, public sympathy and support in that way. And so the public did come out in person um, to support the picket line and also um, uh, obviously on social media. And the press support was all positive. I've never seen um, so much positive press support for uh, a strike before. Uh, even, even the regional conservative uh, news station, Fox, was giving us positive, uh, only positive coverage on the news. It's very, very shocking and exciting. Thank you. Yeah, vielen Dank. Uh, ah ja, gut, das dann gleich am Schluss. Was mich noch interessieren würde, ein, bevor wir dann, denke ich, auch allmählich zum Ende kommen, um, wäre nochmal die Frage, äh, diese Nurse-to-Patient-Ratios, äh, habt ihr da auch äh, ich sag mal, die Entlastung mit durchgesetzt, durchsetzen können? Und äh, wie ist das in der Folge weitergegangen? Das ist eine great question, Harald, und um, one that is very close to my heart. Um, I started um, my own union activism about uh, 10 years ago, uh, fighting uh, just because I was very upset about it, um, fighting with uh, my employer about um, nurse to patient ratios, um, as well as providing uh, nurses um, to, to cover breaks. Um, and so for people that aren't familiar um, with that, uh, if there's anyone on the call who's not uh, a healthcare worker, um, the way that this works is that um, if you're taking care of sick people and you need to take a, a break to eat, to use the toilet, um, to uh, get some water, uh, to get some fresh air, and you're working a 12-hour, 8-hour shift, um, it's not safe often for you to leave your patients. And so um, if the employer doesn't provide someone to come and take care of your patients who actually has the time and attention to do it, then you're put in this situation that many of us are very familiar with, where you have to make a choice between taking care of yourself or taking care of patients. And it feels very uncomfortable, very unfair. Um, and often you have no choice but to either uh, have a full bladder for 12 hours or abandon your patients. Um, and I believe very strongly that's not acceptable. And um, I don't know if the conditions are the same in Germany. It sounds like from the question they might be in some places. Um, and so um, in, in the context where I work, actually, this is a fight that we've previously had. So at the state level in California, California is the only state in the United States that has legislated um, by law nurse to patient ratios. So for example, in the emergency departments in California, like where I work, 
Um, if we have a trauma patient, patient who's been shot or run over by car or other trauma, um, uh, there must be at least one nurse uh, for that patient only, and they can't have any other patients. Um, if uh, the patient has a medical problem that's very serious, uh, you can't have more than two patients at a time. Um, for most ER patients, uh, you know, my stomach hurts or I'm, uh, my chest hurts, but we, but they're not a critical patient. Uh, we cannot have more than four patients at a time by law. And of course, employers um, push the limits of these things. Um, and so at my current workplace, um, at, at this employer, um, we have had many fights uh, and won many fights actually um, in the past before this strike uh, uh, to um, enforce those ratios. Um, and the, the description of, of those campaigns um, are very similar to what I described for the strike. Uh, a lot of one-on-one -on -one conversations um, and also helping educate people about what their rights are and what the law is uh, and um, helping them understand what the employer um, is obligated to do and what their job is, right? Helping people have um, uh, good, healthy boundaries about their responsibility versus their employer's responsibility. And so, um, and I would say also those campaigns contributed in a, in a great way um, to the foundation that we built the strike on. Um, having run those campaigns before, you know, I built relationships and so did others with um, uh, with workers across the health system um, and recruited many new leaders uh, and, and many of them were involved in uh, preparing for the strike. Um, this is a fight that uh, is ongoing. Um, the employer still uh, violates the law about the, the nurse to patient ratios and the staffing is often um, still inadequate. Um, uh, uh, but, but basically that, that's, that's the answer about uh, nurse to patient ratios. Um, is that it's an ongoing fight, but um, but a fight that um, through decades of struggle by uh, nurses unions here in California um, ha has been happening for a long time. So, ich würde jetzt ganz gerne gleich zum Ende kommen, aber Marie hat noch eine kurze Frage oder Anmerkung und das lassen wir natürlich auch noch zu. Yes, hi, thank you. It's Marie again. <laughs> Um, I'd like to know because, can you hear me? Yes, right? Okay. Um, because uh, you uh, talked about a lot about the working conditions and probably it's just because you're a nurse and it's your perspective, obviously. You talk to a nurse patient, ratio and everything, but before you mentioned that um, almost the whole workforce and especially the people with like unsecure contracts and like the most margin marginalized people um all did also strike do you have also some positive change for the people for the cleaning staff for the canteen staff um because i think this act of solidarity um yeah did did they win something too or yeah, I'd like to hear about that. That's that's a great question, Marie. Thank you for that question. Um, so uh, yes, uh, everything I've been describing actually has been universal for all of the workers, not just the nurses. Um, and we've had some internal struggle in the union um, around this topic. Um, and part of um, what I campaigned for union leadership uh, around uh, initially and then uh, again, I've been elected twice, um, is building a coalition of, uh, of workers from different parts of the hospital system and different jobs. Um, and um, what we were campaigning against was a different attitude, a different perspective on how to um, run the union, which was based around uh, more around, I'm going to win things for my group instead of your group. Um, and so we campaigned on solidarity. And so um, uh, we also won some demands from the employer um, about uh, this concept. Um, so um, to give a little bit more description. So um, like I said before, we have uh, around 200 or 250 different job classifications of workers. Um, the largest one is nurses like myself, but um, the majority of our workers are not nurses. 
And uh, we have three contracts that we're bargaining all at the same time. Um, and as chapter president, I'm president uh, over that entire group and all three of those uh, bargaining units. Um, at the beginning of bargaining, based on this principle of solidarity and wanting to bring everyone to the same standards, um, we demanded that the employer allow us to bargain as if we were one big bargaining team for all three contracts and to try um, as much as possible to bring the three contracts into one. Uh, and the employer said, no way, that's never going to happen. We'll never allow that. Um, and because of the strike, we won that demand. And so since the strike, we've been bargaining as one team um, and we've achieved uh, what is called pattern bargaining, where um, if we win something in one contract, it immediately will apply to the others. And so um, what we've been doing is we'll win something, let's say, in the um, the larger contract, which is mostly the lower paid workers, um, and we'll immediately say to the employer, well, you know, we have now in this contract, let's apply it to the other two. And they, they now are saying, yes, OK. Uh, and they, they've agreed to this. Um, I think this is this is essential, an essential principle to have if you want to access the only power that we can have in unions, which is we have the power of, of numbers. We are the people making the work happen. Without us, it doesn't happen. And there are lots of us. Um, and that's really it. And so if, if uh, for example, I were only fighting for the nurse unit, there's a smaller limit on the amount of power you can have. Um, and it causes, I think, unnecessary conflict with people that could be in solidarity with you. Um, so that's a very good question. And it's um, uh, one that I feel very strongly about. We need to be bridging those gaps and not uh, making them larger. Ja, vielen herzlichen Dank nochmal für die Antwort und äh, ich muss sagen, also ich weiß nicht, wie es den anderen, die noch zuhören, sind ja ein paar jetzt rausgegangen, geht, aber ich erkenne doch auch in vielen Punkten halt äh, genau die gleichen Herausforderungen, die wir auch, vor denen wir auch immer wieder stehen in diesen Auseinandersetzungen. Wir haben ja einige Streiks auch schon gehabt, es ist jetzt hier von, äh, äh, na, von der Kollegin Alexandra ist nochmal benannt worden, die langen Streiks, die wir gehabt haben am Universitätsklinikum in Essen, 16 Wochen in 2006, 11 Wochen in 2018. Aber ich glaube, die Aufgaben, vor denen wir stehen, sind wirklich immer wieder die gleichen auch. Die Probleme, vor denen wir stehen, sind ganz offensichtlich auch die gleichen, wenngleich natürlich das Gesundheitssystem in den USA naja, noch schlimmer unter Austeritätsgesichtspunkten äh, unter neoliberaler Formierung leidet als unser Gesundheitssystem. Wenn man sich das anguckt, dann kann man zumindest vielleicht auch die Schlussfolgerung ziehen. Es gibt noch einiges zu verteidigen bei uns auch, wobei wir natürlich aufpassen müssen, schwer aufpassen müssen. Ich möchte mich nochmal ganz, ganz herzlich bei John bedanken. Ich glaube, das waren sehr wichtige und sehr gute Einblicke, die er uns gegeben hat. Und er wird ja jetzt gleich, wenn ich das richtig mitbekommen habe, auch schon wieder in die nächsten Verhandlungen einsteigen. Und dafür wünschen wir natürlich auch ganz enorm guten Erfolg. Ich möchte zum Schluss einfach noch drei kurze äh, Anmerkungen machen ähm, für, für die Veranstaltung. Das, die letzten beiden Veranstaltungen unserer Reihe möchte ich ganz kurz noch nennen. Die finden im Herbst statt. Und zwar am Donnerstag, den 11.03.21 Dumpinglöhne in der Altenpflege. Wird die Allgemeinverbindlichkeit äh, alles wieder besser machen. Und am Donnerstag, den 25.03. Etwas, was wir heute auch schon gehört haben, Union Busting in Krankenhäusern und Pflegeheimen und gewerkschaftliche Gegenstrategien. Für beide Veranstaltungen kann man sich halt eben auf der Seite von der Linksfraktion anmelden. Ich möchte als zweites noch kurz hinweisen darauf, dass vor vier Wochen unser Antrag Systemwechsel im Krankenhaus, Gemeinwohl statt Kostendruck und Profite in der ersten Lesung im Bundestag debattiert worden ist. Es gibt jetzt einen nächsten Schritt. Wir haben einen Termin für eine öffentliche Anhörung am 19.05. Das ist sicher eine spannende Geschichte. Und da wäre es auch ganz gut, wenn wir wieder auch durchaus viele unangemeldete oder nicht eingeforderte Stellungnahmen dazu bekommen und Ähnliches. Der Antrag wird von Jan, genau das hat er jetzt gerade gemacht, im Chat auch nochmal online gestellt. Und ihr wisst ja, dass wir als Linke uns schon seit mehreren Jahren mit dem Thema Menschen vor Profite, Pflegenot schon stoppen, beschäftigen. Es gibt da ja auch eine entsprechende Forderungsliste von uns und auch eine Petition. Äh, diese Petition wird jetzt von Jan auch nochmal online gestellt. Äh, da gibt es den Aufruf, den man unterschreiben kann und natürlich den Link logischerweise auch weiter verbreiten kann. 
Ich möchte mich auch bei euch nochmal ganz herzlich bedanken für die vielen guten Beiträge. Bei John nochmal ganz, ganz herzlich und einen schönen Gruß nach Kalifornien und will dann damit die Veranstaltung beschließen für heute. Okay. Tschüss.